Welcome. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. I'm Sylvia Earle, oceanographer, National Geographic explorer at large, <laughs> founder <laughs> of Mission Blue, and a longtime friend of our of our colleague who's going to be sounding off here very shortly, Wade Davis, who's also an ocean elder. Yes, and right along with you. A National Geographic explorer. So indeed. And this is our show Dive In, where we host informal and open conversations with the ocean community on topics of wonder and interest. We're really glad to be back, uh, squeezing one more episode in before the end of the year. Yay. And we're hoping that everyone is uh, making some time to get outdoors, all safely in these big storms we've been having. Um, nature, and... nature is <laughs> making her wishes known. <laughs> exactly. And we're going to have a Q&A towards the end, unless we get a lot of questions, then I might uh, start a little sooner. But we're just going to dive in today. And as you said, we're so honored to have uh, Wade Davis joining us. Uh, Wade is an anthropologist and ethnobotanist and a prolific author, distinguished explorer, and as you said, an ocean elder too. And last week, he, along with many others, were at um, COP15, a major convention on uh, global biological biodiversity held this time in Montreal, Canada. One of the big headline issues of our time, the loss of life. On yeah. Earth. And, you know, the main headlines were like, how much is this going to cost us to uh, restore biodiversity? And so, how poorly are we doing on our 30 by 30 goals? How much is it going to cost if we don't? How much will it cost mm -hmm. if we don't? And Wade, in his nice, calm way, was, when are we going to listen to all the people, <laughs> the indigenous people, and yeah, well, we're the talking, wisdom. Talking about this and bringing weight on it, you know, we're all indigenous to Earth. That's a, a given. We all live. This is our only home. But some of the people on Earth today have deep, deep roots. I think of them in a way like the the gift of ancient forests that have a long history, and the deep sea. We're we're looking at, at at wisdom, yeah, connected to people, wisdom of nature and humans, that is precious, and we're losing that too. Wade, and there he is. Here we are. Hi, hi, Liz. How are you? Thanks for having me with you. Yeah, well, thank you. I'm going to let um, let us jump under underway here while I try to share the screen, and we're going to remind everyone, of course, that the world is blue. Yes. <laughs> And water connects us all. It does. Single non-negotiable thing that all life requires, whether you're living in the desert or in a great part of the Polynesian um, well, culture surrounded by water. Um, you, you know, uh, Sylvia, you mentioned that, that notion of indigenous, and, and I think it's it, it's an important concept, and certainly the indigenous people have seized upon it, and it's been codified in many important ways by the United Nations, but it, you raise an important point, which is that we are all, of course, indigenous to the planet, and we all share a common responsibility to the planet, and I sometimes feel that this idea of the indigenous people versus what? Who are the others? Well, of course, it's it's quote unquote us. And I've always felt that that kind of perpetuates the same 19th century notion of you know the primitive and the civilized. The truth is there are 7,000 voices of humanity, 7,000 languages, and each one is the vehicle through which the soul of a culture comes into the world. Every language is an old growth forest of the mind, a, a watershed of thought, a, a ecosystem of social possibilities. And all cultures um, are myopic, faithful to their own interpretations of reality. If you translate many indigenous um, people's names, it's the people, the implication being that, you know, only they count. Well, the and chosen we ones are, are culturally myopic in the West. And we forget that this thing we call modernity doesn't exist outside of time and culture. It's a product of both. And our way of thinking is not a universal way of thinking. It is simply the consequence of developments in our own intellectual tradition. And that's a very important thing that does distinguish um, the kind of modern perspective, if you will, from what we often 
um, describe as an indigenous perspective. And what I mean by that, the critical thing is that in the West, in our effort to liberate ourselves from the tyranny of absolute faith during the Enlightenment, and even as we liberated the individual from the collective, which was the sociological equivalent of splitting the atom, we kind of tossed away all notions of myth, magic, mysticism, and above all, metaphor. And when Descartes said that all that exists is mind, matter, uh, and material, in a single gesture, we deanimated the world. As Saul Bellow said, science made a house cleaning of belief. The, the triumph of secular materialism became the conceit of modernity. The idea that the flight of a bird could have meaning, that a river could reflect the ancient path of an anaconda, that, that a, a mountain could be uh, a deity that could influence the lives of the living. All these ideas were not just dismissed as ridiculous, they were ridiculed. And yet we forget that for most cultures around the world, metaphor has defined the way we interact with the natural world. And what I mean by that it's is, cool. you know, you know, I in take. I mean, I, for example, uh, was raised on the coast of British Columbia to believe that these forests existed to be cut. That was the foundation of the ideology of modern scientific forestry that I learned in school and I practiced in the woods as a logger. Now that made me very different from a youth my age amongst the Kwakwakawak who believed that those forests were the abode of Hukuk and the crooked beak of heaven, cannibal spirits at the north end of the world that would be embraced during the Hamatsa initiation such that the initiate could return to the big house having reaffirmed the social order and the moral order of the universe. I was raised to believe that a mountain was a pile of rock that made me different than my godchildren in the Andes raised to believe that a mountain is a, a, a deity that will direct their destiny. You know, the important point isn't to try to say who's right and who's wrong. Is a forest mere cellulose and raw material? Is it the abode of spirits? Is a mountain a pile of raw material, coal, rock, whatever, or is it the abode of a deity? The important thing is how the belief system works its way out in the people, how the conviction plays out in the lives of the people, because the measure of people is not just what they do, but the quality of their aspirations, the metaphors that draw them onward. And so if I'm raised to believe that a mountain is a pile of rock, I will have a different relationship to it than a young kid from the Andes raised to believe that it's a mountain deity. Raised to believe that a forest is to be cut, I'll be different than a kid believe, raised to believe that it's the abode of the spirits. And this accounts for the relationship between indigenous people and the natural world. They're not sentimental. They're not nostalgic. Uh, they're hardly Thoreauian, and they're certainly not Rousseauian. They, they have, however, not just a deep attachment to the land, but a far subtler intuition, the idea that the land only exists because it is filtered through the human imagination. The land, the, the earth doesn't exist simply as a stage set upon which only the human drama um, mm -hmm. unfolds. The, the plants and animals are not inert. In fact, we just saw some images of the Barasana and the Makuna of the Northwest Amazon. Liz, and just pop back to those images for a second, if you could. Um, th this is a, a complex of peoples in the Northwest Amazon, and perhaps their most profound conviction is the idea that plants and animals are just people in another dimension of reality. The role of human beings is to maintain the uh, energetic flows of the universe. The role of the shaman, um, who's a cultural pivot, is not really that of a physician or a priest. He's almost more like a diplomat who maintains constant dialogue with the natural world. He's like a nuclear engineer who periodically must go to the heart of the reactor to reprogram the world. And they absolutely live by this conviction. And so as a result, their mythological tales or cosmological values come together to create what's essentially a land management plan. And when you deconstruct the, uh, the, the, the regulations created by mythological um, dictates, they represent exactly how people can live 
in great numbers in the forest. And we now understand that these societies literally represent the direct descendants of the great civilizations that Aureliana encountered in 1541. And, and often in all of these societies, these beliefs are played out powerfully in ritual. So if we go ahead to the Andes and in, in, in the images just coming up, Liz, um, here's a place where reciprocity drives everything. You know, if our model of interaction with the natural world is extraction, um, reciprocity is the norm. Our way of thinking, dominant, ubiquitous, powerful as it may seem, is in fact not the norm, but highly the anomaly in the human experience. Most societies around the world have a relationship with the natural world based on reciprocity, some iteration of this fundamental idea that the earth owes its bounty to humans, but humans in turn owe their fidelity to the earth. Now in the Andes, that plays out at every single level, labor exchange. Uh, in this case, uh, an elder, an old friend of mine with coca leaf in his hand, blowing what's called a puke. He blows the essence of the leaf to the Apu deities so that the essence of the leaf um, becomes like the clouds that condense into rain to bring water, to bring fertility to the fields to complete this cycle. And again, the use of coca is not just a ritualistic sacrament. The engagement in the use of the sacred plant is a definition of the social matrix of the community. You cannot be of the Andes and not use the sacred plant. The act of using it is itself a kind of a gesture for the continuity, not only of the, the community, but of the earth itself. And these ideas are played out in beautiful ways um, in ritual. So jump to the next image for a second. Once each year in the community of Chinchero, this is my godson, um, <laughs> the fastest young boy uh, is given the honor of becoming a woman. And he puts on the clothing of his sister or mother, and he becomes known as a wailaka, uh, a pejorative term in Quechua for kind of transvestite. And he must carry a banner and lead all able minded men on a run. But it's not your ordinary run. Go to the next image there. Uh, no, uh, so the, the next one, please. And the run begins at 11,500 feet. You run wow. 2,000 feet down to the base of the sacred mountain, and then you run to over 16,000 feet. You fall away into the sacred valley and cross two more soaring Andean ridges over the course of a long ritual day that is less a run than an ordeal. And the, the idea is that you're running the community lands marked by these sacred mounds of earth where the wailaka must spin to bring the vortex of the feminine to the mountain top, where coca leaves are given to Pachamama, perhaps libations of alcohol to the wind. But the marvelous metaphor is that through sacrifice, exhaustion, and sacrifice means in Latin to make sacred, you have once again affirmed your sense of ownership of the land by running the boundaries, but more importantly, your obligations to the earth itself. And so at the end of the day, the individuals have kind of through exhaustion fused into a single entity that has reaffirmed through ritual this powerful relationship between the community and the natural world. And I, I have to tell you, I ran this at the age of 48. I was the oldest man <laughs> and the only outsider ever to do it. And I, I got through it really because I had baptized God's children in that community for so long. And when they heard their padrino was stupid enough to run this race at the age of 48, um, they clung to me throughout the day like limpets. They weren't going to let anything happen to their cash cow who had put them all through school and bought cows and all that stuff. <laughs> but, but it's such a beautiful thing. And, and, and these localized rituals become pan-Andean, uh, things like the Koyeriti, which our good friend Johann Reinhardt and mm -hmm. I um, um, visited together. And here you get thousands of indigenous people from all over the Andes coming into a sacred valley. You can jump ahead, Liz, in a couple of these images. And tens wow. of thousands of people coming into this high valley. It's a perfect fusion of sort of 500 years of Catholic faith, pre-Columbian ideas. And the idea is that the people bring from their communities, their churches, 
And like Christ himself, they carry the crosses high into the valley in the shadow of the sacred mountain. They then carry the crosses into the ice of the glaciers to be reinvigorated by the power of the earth and then reclaimed and carried back to the communities. All of this unfolding in the shadow of Ausangati, the most sacred mountain of the Inca, which you'll see in a moment. And so they, the men, the Pablitos, carry up the crosses. And, and uh, in, the, in the critical moment on the morning of the third day, all of the valley is filled with people with candles kneeling, looking to the heights, you know, beseeching the earth for its blessing. And then the crosses come down and return to the community. And you have this unbelievable affirmation of both the um, this, this reciprocity that exists in what is for them a living landscape, a landscape where, you know, a crop can be wiped out in, a, in, in minutes um, by a hailstorm, where, where the earth rumbles with earthquakes. And these uh, intuitions are very much alive in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta in Colombia, the highest coastal mountain range of the earth, the homeland of the Elder Brothers, the Wiwa, the Canquano, the Arawakos, and the Kogi, who in a bloodstained continent were never conquered by the Spanish. They still remain ruled by a ritual priesthood, the Mamos. They still believe that the prayers and, and, and rituals actually maintain the cosmic balance of the earth, the ecological uh, uh, balance of, of nature itself. They believe that there is no difference between the blood that flows through your veins, the sweat that beads in your neck, and the water of a river. Um, the training for the priesthood involves the acolytes 18 years in the confines of the sacred temples, all the time the world only existing as an abstraction, as they're told about the values, as they learn the rituals, as they are, are told all the time that the world is so beautiful, it's for us to protect. And then suddenly one day, after 18 years of training, young men who have never seen a sunrise, never seen a horizon, are taken on a journey to the heart of the world. And they go from, go ahead, Liz, with some of these images. They go from the inner shadows of their training for 18 years, and then they're taken on a journey to the heart of the world. From the hut to high reaches of Saranqua, the great Madre Creadora, the ice fields and paramos at the top of the mountains. And then they make ritual payments, bringing objects from there back to the sea and from the sea back to the communities. And of course, the entire time on this journey to the heart of the world, as they call it, the priest who has trained them has said, you know, you see, it's as I've told you all these years, the earth is that beautiful. It really is ours to protect. You hold it in your hand. You are the elder brothers. And, and, and these rituals continue to this day. This is a photograph taken at the mouth of the Rio Magdalena, beyond the black line, the traditional territory of the uh, elder brother, but they recognize that everything is connected and the Cienegas and the wetlands and the waters of the great Magdalena and the cold waters of the mountains meeting the heat of the sun. All of this for them is part of a single cosmology in which life itself um, is a reflection of the harmonic balance of nature. And this, I stress, is not hippie ethnography. This is not the rhetoric of wishful thinking. If you look deeply into the ethnographic record at these cultures and so many others, this is actually how they live and what they believe and the values that move them forward. Here's a, a wonderful story. This is a very dear friend of mine, Silvia Mamo Camilo. I've been friends with him 45 years. Uh, I'm about to embark on a big journey with him in January. And he said to me one day um, in Spanish, um, peace will not matter in Colombia if it's only an excuse for the three sides of our conflict to come together to maintain a war against nature. It's time for us to make peace with the entire natural world. And then as we went to make those ritual payments at the mouth of the Magdalena, he mentioned that President Santos, um, Juan Manuel Santos, a Nobel laureate, was going to visit Namusimaki, their traditional homeland uh, village, the center of their life, 
in the Sierra for the first time. And he asked if I could be there to help welcome the president. And I knew that the only way I could go was by hitching a ride logistically on the presidential plane. I made some phone calls and I happily I got invited by President Santos and I joined him and he made, I told him on the way up by his, when we flew up to Valle de Par to get the helicopters, I said, you know, all his aides were surrounding him, um, telling him what statistics and what he should say in his speech. And I quietly put up my hand and I just said, Mr. President, you know, for, for the mamos, you know, los datos no valen nada, you know, statistics don't mean anything. It's what's in your heart. What they care about is nature. And I told him what Mamo Camilo had told me, and he made that the, the, the theme of his speech that was broadcast to the to the world. Um, and so the, 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 the voices of these people are not vestigial. They're not archaic. They're not sort of quaint and colorful. You know, the United Nations has now recognized only during COP15 that the, 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 the wisdom of the Mamos is part of our human patrimony. Now, here's a great example. This is a wonderful, let's go for a moment to the homeland of the first people to walk out of Africa. We know from Spencer's work, Spencer Wells' work and other population geneticists from the Y chromosome tracing that the Aboriginal people of Australia were the first people to walk out of Africa. In 5,000 years, they walked across the underbelly of Asia, and then they reached the most parsimonious continent on earth and they went walking and they made 10,000 clan territories all linked together by a single idea. And that is the dreaming. And the dreaming isn't a dream. It's the idea that the world at your feet both exists and is perpetually waiting to be born. There was no sense of time in the cultures of Australia that not one of the 670 languages and dialects was there a word for present, past or future. The purpose of life was not to improve upon the world, it was to maintain the world as it was at the time of its creation. There is no idealization of progress, no sense of improving upon one's material lot. It was a culture, a civilization of stasis, of constancy. Uh, and this is something that absolutely befuddled the British who arrived there. And they saw a people that looked strange, had a material technology. And But what really offended the British, and show a few of these images here, Liz, was the, this idea that there were people who didn't want to improve upon the lot. And because that was the essence of the value system of 18th century and 19th century uh, Europe, the British, in their inimitable way, concluded that the Aboriginal people weren't human at all, and they began to shoot them. If you can imagine, in 1902, in the lifetime of my grandfather, it was debated in Parliament in Melbourne, Australia, as to whether or not Aboriginal people were human or not. Wow. As recently as the 1950s, ranchers had quotas as to how many abos could be shot with impunity. In the 1960s, there was a textbook used in schools across Australia, a treasury of fauna of Australia that included the Aboriginal people as interesting forms of wildlife. And what was missing was an ability to understand this subtle devotional philosophy. The purpose of life wasn't to improve the world, it was keep the world as it had been born. It would be like all Western intellectual thought and science invested into pruning the shrubs in the Garden of Eden to keep it just as it was when Adam and Eve had their fateful conversation. Now, the interesting thing, Sylvia, of course, is not to say who's right and who's wrong. If we had followed this devotional philosophy, yeah, we wouldn't have developed allopathic medicine. We wouldn't have put a man on the moon. On the other hand, we wouldn't be talking about climate change and our imminent uh, propensity and capacity to change the biological and physical life support systems of the planet. So the point isn't that we should embrace a pre-industrial past. This is really the, this is the real message of, 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 of the collective voices of humanity. It's not that we should embrace a pre-industrial past or that any society, any culture should be not denied the benefits of the best of modernity, the genius of technology, the wizardry of allopathic medicine. <laughs> It's rather to understand and appreciate that the very existence of these diverse ways of thinking, these other ways of being, these other options, puts the lie to those of us within our own tradition 
who say that we cannot change when we all know we must change the right. fundamental way in which we inhabit this planet. What they had, what they ha had or have in their culture, Wade, was such a profound respect for the living world and a desire not to disrupt it. Totally, and I and I and I think I mean I think this is a whole thing, Sylvia. It's 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 again, you know, and, and the fantastic thing is we're not. This is not romantic, uh, r romanticizing. This is it, you know this is about this is just the, the pure ethnographic record. And again, it's 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 to give us the possibility, as as Father Barry always wrote, of of generating a new dream of the earth. It's not to quote unquote go backwards. No culture goes backwards. Uh, cultures are always changing, dancing. Variations on the theme. <laughs> it's how do we find a way to to listen to this message and incorporate it into our own way of doing. And, and we're doing it slowly. I mean, this is what has in fact happened uh, uh, since that incredible vision of the earth brought back from space in by Apollo on, on Christmas Eve 1968. I mean, when we get pessimistic, let's just remember that when you and I were young, just getting people to stop throwing garbage out of a car window was an environmental victory. Right. We spoke incredible. about the biosphere, or biodiversity. Now those are words used in the language of school children. You know, in my lifetime, um, um, and boy, I don't have to tell you, Sylvia, this, you know, women have gone from the kitchen to the boardroom, people of color from the woodshed to the White House, gay people from the closet to the altar. I mean, what's not to love about a world capable of such transformations, but we just have to keep transforming. And the main thing we have to begin and move forward to is, is, is understanding um, that we live on one planet. You know, it's, I, I, I said this in this recent piece I wrote, I, you know, we spend billions of dollars to send um, uh, you know, uh, spaceships into in, into the void to try to find evidence of water on Mars or ice on the moons of Jupiter. Uh, you know, while meanwhile we spend billions of dollars on Earth compromising the sources of fresh water, our lakes and rivers and wetlands that are the source of, of fluid that's so <laughs> precious yeah. and rare in the solar system. You know. Uh, uh, you know, you, you know, it's 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 sort of just kind of kind of crazy. Um, um, Tom Lovejoy, Tom Lovejoy, our beloved friend who passed away last uh, uh, Christmas Day, actually, uh, who brought in, coined the term biodiversity in 1980. Tom once said to me on one of our trips together, he said, "You know, anyone who thinks that the economy trumps ecology should try uh, counting their money with a plastic bag." bag tied tightly around their neck you know um <laughs> <Right> over the head <laughs> over the head rather over the head uh and it reminded me of a wonderful anecdote where i was a small part of a cultural exchange um between uh columbia and guitar that had three uh guitari princes go to the northwest amazon and three barasana and makuna shaman go to the um go to doa and I was there in the capital of Qatar when they arrived, utterly bewildered by what they had seen from the air. And we went out that afternoon with our hosts for an outing. And I could see these shaman uh, scanning the horizon for any sign of life, you know, and their faces got sadder and sadder as the afternoon went on. And when eventually they went back after a month to Bogota, one of their sponsors met with them and asked the obvious question, you know, how was your time abroad? And um, of course, the, the, in the desert, they had seen no rivers, no, no, no forest, no, no, not, a, not a sign of a, anything alive. And so they, they said to their sponsor, how was it? Oh, terrible, terrible, más terrible que terrible, more terrible than terrible. Those people over there are so poor, all they have is money. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Oh, and, uh, it's so yeah. true. And well, Wade, one of the issues that still dominates much of the culture of the world is looking at nature as natural resources to be used. If they can't either turn it into money or something you can eat or sell, then it's useless. It's it's trash. 
it's never yeah I mean, I, and I, but i think i and again i think a lot of that is grounded for, you know you know how do we come to think you know i you know it's 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 funny you know i i used to like every kid growing up in british columbia i worked for a year in a logging camp and and we were we were in Haida Gwaii and we, you know, I was working with a saw that in three minutes could cut down a tree that had taken a thousand years to grow. And we just were a cancer on that forest. And, and in, in a year in that camp, there wasn't a single decision made that had anything to do with anything to do with uh, uh, ecology, let, let alone uh, sustainable yield. Right. We were mining that forest and no one had any illusions about it. And I noticed the only way you could do that, I would under, look at these men in the bush, was by by absolutely denaturing the place. You could not begin to recognize that your boot, when it stepped on the forest floor, was stepping on top of 300 miles of mycelia filament, mm -hmm. connecting the nutrient regime of the forest, allowing trees to communicate uh, to saplings like a mother to a child, you know, as we know it, you know, you had to, you had to change the way you thought about it. Sorry, in the same way that people in the era of of, of horrific slavery had to dehumanize the slave in order to even survive in such a hideous system. Humans and I think the way yeah. to think about the land, we, we couldn't do what we do to it if we didn't think about it the way we think about it. And this is the whole notion of, of deanimating it, you know, and, and uh, seeing it as just a resource and uh, to be extracted. And it's this way of thinking that we have to challenge. And I think we're slowly doing it as 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 the Too society slow. becomes more and more um, literate in biology. You know, one of the things that's so crazy, Sylvia, is that we 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 make our children memorize either patriotic or religious cant, and yet not one child in ten million can recite the formula of life photosynthesis. You know, the the, the simple idea, um, you know, that 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 water. Um, it can come together uh, with carbon dioxide and create the food that we eat and and the and the air that we breathe. I mean, that should be poetic verse memorized by all. No politician should be free to run for office if he or she cannot explain the miracle of photosynthesis and, and the water cycle. <laughs> well, I mean, hydrology, yeah. all these, all of, all of these, all of these, these cycles of life, you know, it's, there's a funny story because I, I came to biology very late in life. Um, I was, I was a history major, you know, and I, I only found out about the beauty of, I love nature, but I didn't know about biology until I went to the Amazon and became a botanist. And I came back and study botany and biology for the first time ever when I was like third year in university. And I, I think I might be the only undergraduate student in the history of Harvard who's been escorted out of the science library by the security guards for hysterically breaking the peace. Because when I understood the Krebs cycle and the cycle of photosynthesis, I absolutely freaked out. I, I felt like I'd seen God and I went racing around that I mean, space at night, shaking every, student, shaking every student and saying, you don't understand, you don't understand. This is how it works, photons of light. And, and it was like a revelation. And they actually escorted me out um, for disturbing the peace. Congratulations. Yes. Hooray. <laughs> but, you know, again, you know, I, 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 I've been so fortunate to spend most of my life and all my professional career living amongst these people who, whose great gift to me has, has been the gift of their vision of life itself. You know, you here in the Arctic, for example, you know, the the whole way that the the personality of the Inuit is such a reflection of ice itself, the way the ice you know ebbs and flows and changes, and the their personality is 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 so deeply impacted by that because that you know they 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 live in a world where there's no time for sentimentality, where death always stalks, where to live they have to kill the things they love most the animals upon which they depend and they maintain this kind of constant dialogue with the animal realm that all hunting societies do uh and and that's what makes except, it so, except so the poignant current, that, that except the current hunting society that commercially kills wildlife 
Well, that's a whole different, that's like the industrialization of murder. I mean, you know, you know, the way we scour the seas and, and uh, I mean, you, you know, the, 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 the tragedy in the Arctic, of course, is that the very ice is melting out from beneath the Inuit people. I mean, I, I, I've, um, you know, in places like Connacht in Northwest Greenland, the ice used to come in in September and stay till July, and now it comes in in November and is gone by March. So the way of life of the people wow. is literally melting from beneath them. Right. Incredible. But knowing it is is the key. If we imagine. Wait, if, if, if we did not know what is now not only known, but knowable, things we could not understand in a global sense until right about now, I think this is the sweet spot, this pivotal time in all of human existence, when we have the capacity to learn from one another in a, on a scale that could never happen. Well, you know, Sylvia, Sylvia, I think that's all. I, I've always loved everything you said. I've been, you know, I, I, but I, I think that's one of the most profound things that you always have said is that, you know, in the lifetime of my, you know, here's an interesting thing. If you, if you think of your, your, your values of your great grandfather, grandfather, our grandparents, yeah. all the things they believed, all the values they held to be true, not only do we not hold those values in many for most of them, we find them reprehensible. Um, and they, they were products of a whole different age. And, and so we can't recriminate them for how they came to view the world as a resource. But we have no excuse to view it that way ourselves. Well, we know. And, and oh, now yeah. that we know, and, and this is, I think, a great hope. And it's something you've always said that, and, and E.O. Wilson also spoke in similar terms that now that we know about about all these dynamics of the natural world and of course we haven't begun to scratch the surface you know there's not a single species of life that we science can say it fully understands but knowing what we do know there is simply no excuse and so if we can forgive our grandparents for their lack of knowledge their ignosis their ignorance um, we will never be forgiven and should not be forgiven by our descendants if we do not act on the knowledge that we have today. And one thing that is has come into focus in our lifetimes, Liz's too, actually, <laughs> that that connectiveness that you speak of that, that is shared throughout all of life, and it starts with water, of course, but now we know there's a common recipe, a number of basic ingredients that make up DNA, that make up RNA, and that the, the capacity for diversity within that basic framework, we're all connected with some of the very same genetic makeup that we find in bacteria, in bats. Yeah. In, in the, the deep sea. In the deep sea. Well, you remember, and you remember, you know, E.O. Wilson famously said, if you took the DNA in one ant and stretched it out in the standard letters, you know, of English letters, it would traverse a thousand miles. And and Spencer, our good friend at the Geographic, Spencer oh, Wells, in his a book, The Journey of uh, of, of Man, uh, and he only calls the Journey of Man because of the Y chromosome. But but Spencer speaks about <laughs> if you, take, if you took the DNA in a, a DNA in a human body and stretched it out in a single row it would reach not just to the moon but to three thousand celestial bodies equidistant from the earth you know the the one of the great revelations that i think and spencer always so impressed me and, and taught me so much about this is that that divide between nature and nurture the divide between culture and 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 nature no longer exists and one of the things that's really brought us together is the genius of genetics and and in our lifetimes you know, the other space shot, not to the moon, but has gone within, and the realization and the proof that we're all cut from the same genetic cloth, that race is biologically a total fiction, you know, that, that the genetic endowment of humanity is a continuum, that we're all children of Africa, including those of us who walked out of Africa. We're, we're all children of microbes. And we're all still in micro, but, I mean, but, in terms of people, of but in terms of people, this is important because it, 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 what Spencer and the population geneticists did is prove the truth of the intuitions of people like Franz Boas, who always said that every culture is just a, 
a product of itself that you know that 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 the other peoples of the world aren't failed attempts at being you each is a unique answer to a fundamental question what does it mean to be human and alive that that every culture has something to say each deserves to be heard just as none has monopoly in the root to the divine as you know ruth benedict famously said the purpose of anthropology is to make the world safe for human differences but what we understand if we accept that we're all cut from the same genetic cloth it means that every culture by definition shares the same raw human genius the same mental acuity the same potential mm. and critically how this genius is expressed is simply a matter of adaptive imperatives and choices so we in the west may have celebrated um technological wizardry the aboriginal people of australia may invest that genius into the complex task of unraveling the mystic threads of memory inherent in a myth but it's just a matter of choice there is no hierarchy in the realm of culture that idea that was shared by our grandparents that culture somehow went from the savage to the barbarian to the civilized to the strand of london that you know that european western technological society sat at the apex of a pyramid going down to the so-called primitives that's been absolutely dis dismissed and by science and shown to be an artifact of the 19th century no more relevant to our lives today than the notion that clergymen had uh, that, that the earth was in that century, that the earth was but 6,000 years old. In, in a stunning way, it's genetics has come flat. to affirm the connectedness of humanity. And yet look here, I mean, the, 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 the people on these images here, the Penan, the last nomadic peoples of Southeast Asia, a, a society of hunters and gatherers who had lived in the upland forests of Borneo for generations, a uh, uh, people who have a quality of being that is reflective and a, 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 a consequence of, a, of their adaptation. They have no word for thank you in their language because sharing is an automatic reflex. You never know who will be the next to bring food to the table. I once gave a cigarette to a Penan woman in an encampment and watched as she tore it apart to distribute the individual strands of tobacco equitably to to, to render the product useless, but to honor her obligation to share. They, they really do live by the adage that a poor man shames us all. When uh, we brought uh, at their request three elders to Vancouver uh, as part of an international tour to draw attention to the plight of their homeland subject to the worst deforestation in the tropical world in the 1980s, nothing in Vancouver, the first city they had known, impressed them like homelessness. They could not believe that a, a society so bountiful could allow homelessness to exist. Uh, and yet here's a people that have lived in that forest with a kind of perspicacious knowledge of that forest that would put any Harvard scientist to shame. And yet within a single lifetime, a single generation, that forest has been torn from beneath them. And with that has gone a way of life, morally inspired, inherently right and effortlessly pursued for generations, all to transform one of the richest tropical forest biomes in the world uh, into plantations for African oil palm. Yeah, yeah. Well, palm oil, it's terrible. It's, now we know, I mean, that is the key. How do we get the, that wisdom as well as the facts and figures embedded into everyday decision making and right. and how do we pull it into the into back into the conservation story you know we see so many times we set these big areas aside for you know for protection for conservation and yet we want to dislocate the, the well things. i think that's a great point liz i mean the, 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 let's remember that the protected area thing the idea of a wilderness park was very much a kind of an American invention. You know, um, during the 19th century, um, people like Teddy Roosevelt and, and John Muir and many others uh, were acutely aware of the degradation of the American landscape uh, uh, through industrial uh, initiatives. And, 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 uh, and so these parks were conceived as kind of cathedrals of the wild, wildernesses, empty of people. Uh, it almost bore echoes of terra nullius, you know, the idea that the colonists arrived in America and sort of declared it to be empty of people and therefore proceeded to make it so through slaughter. And so the idea of a national park never included people. And uh, in fact, Teddy Roosevelt, hero as he is to the conservation movement, uh, 
um, uh, was an incredible uh, anti indigenous person. I mean, he hated native people. He called him a pestilence to be removed from the body of America. And John Muir wasn't much more charitable when he insisted on removing all the native people from his newly minted park of Yosemite. And so this idea of protected areas being without people obviously worked in a world, the United States, which in fact had emptied itself to some extent of indigenous people. Don't forget that, for example, the demise of the buffalo didn't come about as somehow uh, a consequence of the slow, uh, inexorable progression of the American frontier. It was a consequence of explicit policy of the U.S. government post-Civil War to eliminate the commissary of the Great Plains cultures. It, it, from 1871, the height of the populations, when there were more buffalo in North America than people, to their reduction to a zoological curiosity in 1878, that was seven years. The campaign was orchestrated by Sheridan, the Civil War general, and when the last of the buffalo was a shadow in the prairie and the last of the great chiefs were on the reservations, he recommended to Congress that a commemorative medal be minted that would have on one side of it a dead buffalo and on the other side a dead Indian. Wow. So this idea of, of parks without people began then. And of course, they bumped up against the obvious when nations around the world began to create their own parks and parks that could not be without people. And, and, and gradually, this model became the obvious. And now we recognize, as it was seen at COP15 recently in Montreal, that, that an enormous percentage, I think at least 60% of the remaining terrestrial biodiversity, and I don't know what the figure would be in terms of marine uh, biodiversity, um, but is at least titularly under the control of indigenous people who are increasingly being recognized for their for for their political rights and their land rights and as stewards of these landscapes and, well, and uh, think, about, think about it way that the pacific the oldest deepest widest body of water on the planet it was considered home for the polynesians yeah but having said that all humans are newcomers on a planet that has taken not just hundreds or thousands, but literally billions of years to assemble. And I, I do respect places where we don't, where, where like the deep sea, we have really no business in mm -hmm. trading, at least in a, in a, you know, a taking sort of way. Oh yeah, like, I, I mean, I think I think there's, there's you know, it's, it's half yeah. the world. Yeah, I mean, the idea of finding these places, uh, you know, that, I mean, you know, and and, and absolutely eliminating the human footprint uh, uh, for for all kinds of reasons is, is I mean, there's but no the reason we should be doing that. One of the wonderful, I think, insights that, it, that has come into focus, mostly in the, in, in the 21st century, although intellectually, it was pretty obvious long ago that the greatest diversity and abundance of life, the greatest diversity is in the ocean, that, that nearly all of the major divisions of animals, 30, 35 of them, they're all out there in the ocean, only about half have representation on the land. It's our history, our roots, our DNA is anchored in the in the ocean. I think that's one of the hardest things in what you're doing, and and you know, is that um, it's 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 hard enough to get people to pay attention to the forest that they live in, you know, the air that they breathe on land, and then most people, as you well know, look out at the ocean and they, they just see the flat surface of it, and, <laughs> and 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 they don't have any opportunity to physically viscerally explore it and 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 uh you know a, a great friend of mine who was a great activist uh, for the environment here in canada paul george i once asked him what's the best thing we can do for the environment he always said get people into it you know you can't That's get right. people to no child no they, <laughs> i mean you, you you can't get people to protect something they don't have any yeah. experience of and i think with the 
I mean, you've done obviously as an advocate, you know, you and a handful of other people, Jacques Cousteau, and you know, you, you know, you, 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 to me, you, you, you top them all. Um, but one person isn't enough, you know. You know, trying to unveil the wonder of the seas, um, which is why I think the Polynesian message is important because we can link people to the ocean in, in, in a way that maybe can be a conduit for uh, land-based peoples to appreciate the sea more. I mean, you know, when you, when someone like our, our, our friends like Nainoa speak of the ocean, I mean- it, Our fellow it, ocean elder. Our fellow yeah. <laughs> ocean elder, or, or any of the Polynesians that I have been fortunate to sail with, you know, um, they're kind of ambassadors for the deep as well as the, you know, their own remarkable oh. civilization. Oh. There's another ocean elder. I'd love your comments. Maybe you have seen The Way of Water, Jim Cameron's latest salvo. <laughs> well, no, you know, it's, Jim is so is so um, so thoughtful. I don't know, Sylvia, if you knew that um, before he went into filming of the the latest Avatar that's just come out, he invited me to come down to um, his studio uh, to speak um, to all the cast and all the uh, senior people on the production, just as he had taken them all uh, to Hawaii to the forest, I think before he did the first Avatar, because he wanted to remind them that they weren't making some kind of sci-fi fantasy. They were actually terrible, as it is to say, doing a documentary feature just right. with animated figures, right? And I think that's really the power of Avatar. And and. Uh, uh, and and the real contribution of of Jim, you know, uh, I love the reference to unobtainium, unobtainium, exactly. The, 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, I think you know, frankly, I think Jim's a good friend of ours and a fellow explorer in residence, and I, I think he deserves a tremendous amount of support from all of us because you know already people are nipping at his heels about this or that. Always these naysayers, you know, who say you know, you know, whatever, you know, about, and he's, he's, he's got pretty thick skin, but, but I think he's made a huge contribution. Absolutely. You know, it's, he's so talented in ways that very few people are in terms of his artistic and scientific and, uh, and coming art and science and engineering, together, and engineering <laughs> yeah. Yeah. coming together and at just the right time, because it's the first time that we really have this capacity to look at the entity, all of it, the people, the diversity of life and where we fit in. That this is, if you had to choose a time to be around, I think this is maybe the most important time of all of human history because we have a chance to get it right. And it, but it takes communicators such as you, it takes Jim Cameron takes and I know a, and it you takes the, the, Sylvia the, Earl, Sylvia Earl. <laughs> well, I, so, I look at yeah. National Geographic's capacity mm -hmm. to bring all this together. I mean, before there was television, there was National Geographic. To, well, you to, know, it's, it's funny, you know, Sylvia, I, you know, after I kind of left Geographic and became a professor at a big university, boy, did I miss the Geographic. And one of the things that I I look back on um, not just fondly, but kind of, you know, it, it was so collegial. And I think it was collegial because not only was everybody doing wonderful things and you, you couldn't walk into that building without being dazzled by the, the next encounter with some unbelievable character, man or woman, old or young. Uh, but I think there was a deeper thing. I think, I think there was a real collective spoken, unspoken about, maybe not spoken about rather but never forgotten collective commitment to conservation that we were we in every way people there uh were 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 finding support from each other um on a collective mission of which we were singular parts you know and i think that gave a, a kind of i think it, it was one of those things that kept all of us going and uh so, so that 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 certainly was a, a wonderful. It had to do with eight billion people, though, Wade. With the, you know, it's when you think about the way of life that was possible in Australia, fifty thousand years ago or ten thousand years ago. Here we are, facing 
a, a diminishing natural world and an increasing domination by by one species. Yeah, no, I mean it. It is it, 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 you know it, it, it. It's what you know. People often say you know how do you remain optimistic? And I I um I guess my answer is is sort of you know my. my I've just always thought pessimism was an indulgence and despair kind of an insult to the imagination, just like orthodoxy, the enemy of invention. I, you know, I, 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 I kind of feel like we have to be realistic, but we also have an obligation to, to maintain hope, you know? Um, exactly. And, and uh, um, you know, one way I get through it, Sylvia, um, my, father, my father wasn't a religious man. Uh, he was broken by the war. I never saw the inside of a church in his presence. But he, he was a deeply ethical and moral man, and 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 he believed in good and evil. And he used to say to me, you know, way there's good and evil in the world. Take your side and get on with it. And what he was sort of saying was that um, we have this idea in Christianity that you know if we tr try hard enough, evil's going to vanquish good. I mean, good's going to vanquish evil. It ain't going to happen. Uh, you know, and in the in the early days of the Christian church, or the, at least the Middle Ages, you know, if you ask the obvious question, if God's all powerful, why does he allow evil in the universe, you were burned at the stake for heresy. But when Lord Krishna was asked that in a kind of a Vedic tradition, uh, you know, if God's all powerful, why does he allow evil in the universe, Lord Krishna said to thicken the plot. In other words, you know, good and bad, or, or good and evil, if you will, seem to walk hand in hand. And I, I think my, my father was saying, was don't expect to win, do your best, but keep fighting. In other words, if you don't expect to win, you'll never be disappointed in losing. And I think bitterness often comes, um, or burnout, to those who keep thinking they're going to win, and they keep getting disappointed in losing, and eventually it, it corrodes their spirit. You know, I've I've found in my own life that I've won some great environmental battles here in British Columbia. I've lost some. I've had enormous corruption to face uh, that I can't overcome in the media. Um, but you know, I've never kind of expected to win in a way. That doesn't mean it's, it doesn't mean I don't fight hard. On the contrary, it's a very attitude that allows me to continue to fight. So that I honestly feel that even though I'm now 69, a, 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 I guess a toddler compared to you. But you never stop fighting either, you know, and you've seen so much uh, disappear. It's persistence. And you yeah. think it's hopeless, then it is hopeless. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think I think also we have an obligation to those who come beneath us, younger generations. You know, yeah. there's nothing worse than an old man. You know, what is life but a story? You lose the power of understanding as you get old. So, you know, you, you know, it used to be good or the commencement speech that begins, the world's a mess, it's up to you to fix it. Like hell it is, you know, you didn't, they're not the ones, you know. I, I think that, I think that you kind of, we have an obligation to, to um, kindle hope. And that, that, I don't think that's naive. I think it's, um, it's uh, it, it's in a way it's a form of courage. So we're we're almost at the top of the hour. We have a few questions. Are you guys ready for them? Sure, okay, sure. Just, we'll just make them quick. <laughs> um, Victoria is asking us. She said that uh, her mother's told her that Brazil has the highest concentration of uncontacted tribes on Earth, living in real connection with the world. Um, should they be contacted or not? Well, that's actually a very complicated question because of many of these, many of these societies that are quote unquote uncontacted are in fact societies that may well have simply fled into isolation in the wake of the horrific rubber boom. You know, we forget that at the turn of the 20th century, uh, rubber was this extraordinary commodity. The only source was the Amazon, uh, and on places like the Rio Putumayo, which became known as the River of Death. The Bora and Witoto populations literally collapsed. You know, uh, it was a, it was a kind of an economic holocaust, and 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 to survive, uh, uh, many peoples fled. So you know, you know, the, the, that's one issue. And the, the other issue is, um, um, it's very difficult to generate contact without um, generating. Um, societal collapse through the introduction of disease, no matter how careful one is. 
at the same time, the argument of groups like FUNAI uh, in Brazil has always been to attempt a kind of soft contact, to, to have the best people contact so that Western medicine can arrive if Western disease gets there. It's a very complicated issue. There are un, quote unquote uncontacted groups uh, in Peru, certainly in Colombia, throughout the North uh, West Amazon. But I think a bigger issue is the overall human rights and integrity of the indigenous people who are have been in contact with the outside world in some cases for generations and the question of the amazon itself how do we preserve the basin of the greatest forest on earth and there are plans in place like the um the triple a corridor you know the initiative um, that martin von hildebrand's been behind to connect a single corridor from the Andes to the Atlantic across the entire northern sweep of the Amazon. And if you actually look at the map of both protected indigenous resguardos or reserves together with protected areas and national parks, there aren't that many gaps to fill in to create a single corridor of protection um, from the Andes to the Atlantic. So I think this is where our energy should, should go. Um, and in terms of uncontacted peoples, I think we should do everything we can to uh, uh, allow them to live out their destinies as they have chosen to do. Well, thank Respect. you. Yeah. Well, we're really at the top of the hour, so we're going to, in interest and honor of your time, Wade and our uh, viewers, we're going to sign off for the year. But we'll be back next year, and we'd like to say thank you so much for uh, coming and joining us today and to thank all of our viewers. Could we call this to be continued? Sure, you bet. Anytime. You know, oh, we'll come back again, I, yes. Before I go, I just want to live, uh, Sylvia, I love you so much. I admire you so much. Uh, you're kind of a model for so many of us, and uh, the way you keep at it and keep going is just extraordinary. So God bless you, and I hope you live a thousand more years. <laughs> good start good start <laughs> okay Thank you, thanks very much liz and bye and thanks, we go. water connects okay. us all and we need to take care of the ocean as and if, the land as if our lives depend on it because they do, they do. <laughs> thanks again thank you wade we'll see you next year <laughs>